Good morning, everyone. At the onset, I would like to thank the IOS for giving me this opportunity to share my views on Roadmap to PG Dissertation or Thesis. This is particularly a topic which is very close to my heart. Anything related to research is very close to my heart. I am uh, Professor Priyanka Kapoor. I am Professor in Charge uh, Orthodontics, Faculty of Dentistry, Jamia Malaya Islamia. And, um, you know, whatever I present here today is just based on my experience of doing this uh, research for so many years, ever since I finished my post-graduation in 2006. And nothing in this lecture is particularly theoretical or didactic. It's just, you know, based on my personal experience. So this is just a little proof of uh, what I'm about to speak. And, you know, I was so happy to know uh, things have been circulating in the iOS, WhatsApp groups and all before uh, we began this program. And I was happy to know that um, our first year postgraduates are also amongst the audience today. So, you know, this is particularly this uh, picture that you're seeing is my thesis. And uh, probably when we think about thesis, and this is the final version, the printed version that we all envision when we start uh, our postgraduate program. And when we are told that, okay, we have to do the thesis for this particular MDS program. And so, you know, uh, I tried to place myself in the shoes of first year postgraduates. And then, you know, I started doing that reverse engineering. Okay, where do I start and how would I begin if I were a first, first year postgraduate? So that's what uh, we are here to discuss today. I kind of, you know, always prepare a kind of a mind map of how I'm about, I'm going to progress about any topic that I'm going to uh, perform. So, you know, this is particularly the stepwise ladder platform that I have prepared. How we are going to go about this lecture. In fact, not about this lecture. If, as I said, if I were a postgraduate, how would I step on one step to the other if I have to reach the final destination of that printed thesis that I just showed you? So first of all, what we have to do and what all postgraduates do when they enter the post-graduation is when the guide tells you, go and look for a thesis topic. This is a favorite, favorite line that every postgraduate is going to listen to. But then, this is our expression. But no, it's not that tough. Let's go step by step. So first of all, since if we are new to, uh, you know, orthodontics or we don't know uh, what are the areas that uh, the research is happening in orthodontics, what we have to do is we have to basically outline, okay, there are three different, three main different kind of uh, areas that we look about when we talk about orthodontics. It can be clinical areas, it can be basic sciences like the biomarkers or any kind of uh, genetic uh, studies that we have to do or any kind of innovations, whether it is in material sciences, or it is in some instruments, or it is in some designs. So that kind of innovations also can be targeted. Or nowadays, artificial intelligence is an upcoming thing. So we have a lot of data. Orthodontists, you know, they are known to keep so many records of photographs, radiographs, case history sheets, models, 3D models. So those kind of data also come handy when we talk about the artificial intelligence. But if you look about the four main basic areas are biomaterial application or biological responses or orthopedic or orthodontic treatment options or teleorthodontics. So this was basically um, uh, an article that was put forward by APOS. And so this, and it is a very recent article. And this were the research developments that was put forward in the University of Sydney, just to give you a basic idea. And the bibliometric analysis also shows that the top five research areas in orthodontics in recent years have been on treatment or biomechanics, on growth and development, or diagnosis, or psychological studies, or imaging, or interdisciplinary uh, topics in relation with periodontics. So we have to know, okay, these are the basic areas, but how do we identify those areas? That's important. So we go step by step. 
First of all, we locate a broad research area. Like I said, if it's a clinical topic, it can be treatment, it can be biomechanics, it can be any kind of digital uh, orthodontics. So any kind of clinical uh, field that we look for, or it can be any uh, basic sciences research. So main broad areas we have to look down and then we have to narrow down to the research topic. So we don't start with the research topic. We start with an area and then we narrow down to a topic. And how do we do about it? Let me just explain these. What I've written, I'm not actually, I'm not that kind of a person who would just look down and would read line by line. And then, you know, I'll try to memorize it. Not like that. Let's go practically. So the types of articles that are published where you have to look for those research areas Basically, the idea of research can come from the articles. There are three different kinds of articles that usually you have. In the primary research areas, you have original research articles. You have randomized clinical trials. You have control trials or you have experimental studies. So these are the kind of studies that you're going to look for if you have to look for an idea of research. But if you talk about the secondary research, which is, you know, it culminates from the primary research. You kind of deduce the um, results of the primary research and then present it as a uh, secondary research in the form of systematic reviews or meta-analysis. I would not recommend that initially you go through it because you're not going to understand. If I would be a first year postgraduate, I would first start from actually looking at an article. What kind of articles should I look for if I have to look for a research topic? And they are the same original research articles, randomized control trials, clinical trials, and experimental studies. So let me start with the basic thing. So you know that the three main, okay, you can look for three main uh, journals of your uh, speciality of orthodontics, which is primarily the American Journal of Orthodontics, the Anglo Orthodontics, the EGO, or any other uh, um, article also, or any other journal also you can look for, like Progress in Orthodontics or GIOS. You can look for those, but you have to look for the latest articles. You have to look for the latest issues, at least three latest issues you have to go for when you look for a research topic. So I've just given you an example. This is October 2024, AGO Duo. So if you just look at the index, now you're just looking at the index right now. I'm not telling you to read any article at that time. So you just go through the index and you will see which are the topics which are repeating themselves again and again. So in this one issue only, if you see, there are two main topics which have come twice. One is the psychological studies of patients related to treatment or uh, the treatment acceptance. The other is clear aligner therapy. Yes, that's a very hot topic. We Everybody knows, you know, patients are also always asking about the aligner therapies. So yes, these are the two main topics that have been covered again and again in the latest issue of AGO Duo. Now let us go to EGO. We are not finding in the latest issue of EGO, we did not find aligners. We did not find the psychological studies, but we found something else, which was retainers. So they are talking more about the retainers. And they've also listed one systematic review about the fixed bonded retainers. So yes, they have an area which is slightly different. And this is just one issue I'm talking about. But yes, if you look at the three last issues, definitely many of these topics are going to repeat themselves. Now you come to angle orthodontist. Again, they're talking about retainers. They're talking about three-dimensional printed retainers. They're talking about fixed lingual retainers. So, you know, majorly, if you kind of outline, if I would be a PG student, my guide would tell me, okay, don't stick to one topic, bring two or three topics. So I would list down, okay, psychological studies can be important for the patient satisfaction or patient acceptance or the fixed or, uh, you know, removable retainers can be an important um, topic area or aligners can be a topic area. So the main topic areas I've outlined, okay, these are the three main topic areas, but which one to choose? So how is that possible? So you go about the final criteria, which is F for feasibility, I for is it interesting, N for novelty, E for ethical, and R for relevant. So let's go, let's just discuss this mainly because now I just have the research areas. So if I'm talking about retainers, is it feasible? Yes, 
I talk to my seniors and they tell me, yes, we give the retainers day in and day out. So retainers is not a problem. And we give all kinds of retainers. We get removal retainers. We get fixed retainers. We give SX retainers. And we have all kind of diagnostic abilities to look at the, uh, you know, the uh, effectiveness of these retainers also. So feasibility, yes, that is possible. Is it interesting for me? Well, that is for me to decide. Every postgraduate can decide for himself or herself whether a clinical topic like a retainer would be important or would be interesting for me or I can also go into some kind of, if I'm more interested in computers, I can go for some artificial intelligence related to retainers also, or I can look for some other topics if I'm not, you know, I don't find it interesting. Why I'm saying interesting? Because it is very, very important. This is one topic that is going to be with you day in, day out for next three years. So if you don't find it interesting, you are not going to give 100% for it. And then it is not going to be as successful as you would like it to be. You know, this is the only research that you're going to give 100% for. And it is going to follow you through your life. If you talk about me, my thesis topic was interleukin-1, beta, and canine retraction and distraction. And trust me, I fell in love with the topic and I'm continuing the topic 18 years after even I've completed my post-graduation. I have diversified in various areas related to biomarkers only, but that became my first love. So yes, interesting. It has to be interesting. Otherwise, you're not going to do it diligently. Novelty. Okay, novelty, we all relate to something completely new, something nobody has done. No, it is not like that. You also can find certain gaps in the areas that have been covered and you can take those gaps and they can be newer findings. So you can just stick to newer findings also. It is not necessary that your topic has to be completely novel. You can just look for a gap and that can be a novel finding. The main thing is that you have to understand the research process and then do it diligently so that even if it's a small one finding, you have completed it to the T and you have followed all the research process and there has been no mistake. That is the crux of doing the thesis properly. Is it ethical? Yes, obviously. If uh, you are taking up a research topic, it has to be ethically sound. Means that, you know, you cannot look for a topic where you're not giving treatment to the patients when they can be benefited by those treatments. So it has to be ethical. And every kind of consent form, informed consent form, or uh, assent form if the children are young, that have to be taken in the ethical issues. Is it relevant? Well, it has to be relevant for the current times. That is why I said, when I said that you look for Three issues, three latest issues of three major journals of our speciality. You know, it has to be relevant. You don't see uh, many of uh, the big mechanotherapy being discussed in the latest issues. Why? Because it is not relevant in current times. So we have to see if it is relevant in current times. Because whatever you are producing as a thesis is a very good form of primary literature. And that primary literature has to benefit science. It has to benefit the clinical outcomes or the clinics where we are practicing. If they are not applicable to the patients in any way now, in the current times, it is of no value. So if you are spending three years, please be very sure that it has to be relevant to the current times. In the feasibility aspects, you also have to see <coughs> sorry, whether it is feasible in the money matters also. Whether you are able to afford it whether it is manageable in that three years of time. So you also have to see the feasibility in that. Well, when we are talking about the research area right now, we have not finally listed the topic as of now. So for the seniors, you can just ask, okay, are these kind of patients available? Are the diagnostic tools available? Whether it is in scope of our uh, institution and whether I'll be able to do the study in three years. They can guide you through it. So before taking your topic to your guide again, you have to be slightly clear about the finer criteria of your research area. Now, when you narrow down from a research area to a research topic, how do you go about it? Well, 
first of all, you go to the Google Scholar. So if I'm talking about, I'll just take an example of retainers. So I've typed retainers here. Now you see this kind of a structure will open up in front of you. You can see many articles. You go through first 10 articles and if you find an interesting article, please go through it. But I'll always try to tell you that you look at the left side, you can see the time limits. You can also set the time limits because if you're looking for any primary research for a research topic, you want it to be completely new. So you can look for since 2023 or since 2024, you can select that. And only those articles are going to appear. Or the other thought can be that, okay, which area in this, uh, in this research area, what topic has been studied more commonly? So you can go by the citations also. If you see, you have citations here, cited by 346, cited by 330. So you can go by citation number also. Okay, this has been researched quite often. So I should take up this. So that is up to you. You can either go for the most recent one or you can go for the most cited one also. The other area which where you can look for is PubMed. So you all should be well aware of PubMed, how PubMed works. Well, this is not the platform to discuss how you formulate a search strategy in PubMed, but it's very, very important that you become comfortable with this database. Why I'm telling you this? Because it is going to be useful not only in this primary area of research, but also when you try to publish the secondary research. And if you look for it down, if you scroll in this uh, interface, when you see of PubMed, you look at this mesh database. You can see this. <clears throat> this is medical subject headings. Be very clear that if you are surfing the PubMed, you should know what is medical subject heading database. Well, this is a kind of a vocabulary that PubMed uses. So if you're talking about orthodontic retainers, like, you know, you should know what is the vocabulary that is used in PubMed for it. Because if you use their vocabulary, it is going to search everything related to that topic. But if you don't use their vocabulary, it is just going to look for that word that you're putting in the search box. So let me tell you, orthodontic retainers, if you see, I've just put an example here. So you can see it's a mesh term and gingival recession. I've just put one kind of a research topic which I, I want to you know search for in relation to retainers. So I have stuck to my uh, research area, which is orthodontic retainers, but now I'm more interested in a research topic which is related to recession. So let me just uh, type orthodontic retainers, which is a mesh term along with gingival uh, recession. So I can see these kind of results. So you can, you can also look for any other topics also. So research area, as I said, can be very broad, but you can narrow down to the research topic in any capacity that you can search. So orthodontic retainers, you can just type orthodontic retainers also so that you can look for various kind of studies that have been done in relation to orthodontic retainers. But as I said, we can apply filters here, which is very, very important. So I have applied for the filters like in the last five years, you can see. And I have also applied for filter of randomized control trial. So as I said, preliminary, if you're looking for a research topic, look for primary research. Primary research is one which is done in our clinics. So it can be either a randomized trial or a clinical trial or experimental studies. So I have put a filter for randomized control trial and look what I've got. I've got one result of influence of fixed orthodontic steel retainers on gingival health and recession of mandibular anterior teeth in intact periodontium. So they are also talking about gingival health. So I was right in when I was searching. So now that you have located the research topic, first was research area, then you narrowed it down to a research topic. Now you want to find a research gap because if you don't find a gap, what for are you doing that research for? Because there is a gap. So you thought, okay, I will be doing research and I will be answering this gap. So let us read with a method. So when you talk about gap, where all would you find a gap? Well, the previously published research is a very good guide for giving you this gap. So if you talk about the abstract, first of all, now that it's just an abstract, towards the end where you have the conclusions or end of the results, 
the studies will always show you some gap. So if this is a study on long-term periodontal status with mandibular fixed retention, you can see the gap is listed here that it raises the question of appropriateness of lingual fixed retainers as standard retention form for all patients, regardless of their attitude to dental hygiene. So what does that mean? That in the further studies that you plan, either you plan with some experimental um, design where you have the hygiene status of two kinds of patients different or the protocols are different. So you can look for that. That is also one gap that you can target. Or you have influence of fixed orthodontic steel retainers on gingival health. This also has listed retention, uh, the limitations. The limitations, as I said, you will find at the end of abstract or you will find at the end of discussion. Wherever the discussion is there, towards the end, always good studies will list their own limitations. You take a cue from those limitations and then you build up your research gap that, okay, now this study is done. This is a limitation. Now I'm going to target this limitation and I'm going to do further research. So this is the paragraph on limitations and you can take up any of the limitations and plan your further research. Again, this is my own study. And here also, I've just tried to show you that towards the end of discussion, we have listed our limitations so that any further researcher who wants to do a study on OSA and craniofacial airway morphology can look for these limitations and plan a further research. Then we applied a filter on systematic reviews. Now, when we decided, okay, this is a randomized clinical trial, which is of interest to us and also talks about recession, why not look on the secondary research? Secondary research in the form of evidence-based research, the scoping reviews or a systematic reviews, they are also useful because at the end of systematic reviews, always there is a discussion on the limitations in either the study methodology, the designs, the samples, or wherever there was heterogeneity present. So it is always good to also look for systematic reviews when you plan your research gaps in the uh, particular research topic or the area that you are going to list. So this is also, and as, as I said, I've applied this filter of five years. So you can see this. This is last five years and I've applied this filter. So this is one way. So you can look for Google Scholar, you can look for PubMed, you can apply a filter of five years, you can apply a filter of randomized clinical trial, or then you can also go for the gap. And in the gap, you can look at the end of abstract, or you can look at the end of discussion. And you can also look at the end of systematic review discussion uh, if you look for the last five years of systematic reviews. And this is a very interesting thing because every child or every postgraduate now is using chat GPT in some form or the other. But I will not recommend that you start with chat GPT. Now that you've listed, okay, this is my area of interest. Retainers is my area of interest. I want to study the gingival health. Now you can also type in chat GPT. Is it a good topic? Ask chat GPT. It's going to give you some answer. Also ask, what are the research gaps now? in the retainer uh, topic when you talk about orthodontics. So this has this is listed now. So longitudinal studies are missing. There is a lack of literature. Patient-specific factors are missing. Technological advances are missing. Economic consideration and patient education. So after you have done your homework, now you can go to chat GPT and reaffirm or reconfirm whatever gaps you were trying to list from the primary studies. So please don't take shortcuts. Don't go to chat GPT, first of all. This is just for confirmation. Take home, make one page review. So now that you have listed a few articles, you have seen a few articles, now you prepare at least for two or three topics, prepare one page summary before you take to your guide. This is my sincere, sincere request. And in that, as I said, go format wise. Go for one research area, then go for one research topic, and then you list down, okay, what are the research gaps and different studies, what research gaps they have listed. Then preliminary, okay, this is the feasibility or the final criteria applied to the three research areas that you have listed. So there is three research areas that initially we discussed were retainers, aligners, and psychological uh, patient outcomes. So you can take these three topics to your guide and let them decide. And then limitations or extensions or the potential impact also if you want to discuss. But this kind of a summary is quite okay for you to take to your guide. 
So yes, we have done a lot of work, but now let's go forward. Now you have to formulate a research question. Now that you've decided, okay, the research gap is that not many studies have been done on fixed lingual retainers and their effect on periodontium or the patient tolerance. So you decide on one particular central question, which becomes your main aim, which is what are the effects of fixed lingual retainers on periodontium and patient tolerance when compared to removable retainers? And two or three short questions. Okay, you, you want to discuss gingival recession, you want to discuss calculus, or you want to discuss patient tolerance. So you can formulate two or three small questions. But one main research question, which becomes your main aim. So how do you write the main aim? To determine the effects of fixed lingual retainers on periodontion and patient tolerance when compared to removal. So what do you have? You have a PICO format in this, which is patient, intervention, comparator, and outcome. For every objective also, you have these four terminologies. Comparator is still kind of okay. Many of the studies do not have a comparator, but you have patient, you have intervention, and you have outcome. Title. What should the title be of your research? Well, it should be indicative of your research and for all practical purposes. Just take your main aim, cut it short, cut the clutter, remove the extra words, and your title is ready. Very, very simple and very, very direct. So if you are, your main aim is to determine the effect of fixed lingual retainers on periodontium and patient tolerance when compared to removable orthodontic retainers, your title can be the effect of fixed lingual retainers on periodontial and patient tolerance, a comparative study or a randomized clinical trial. Simple. So all your extra words are gone and your study design is also mentioned. That is also a good thing. So I've just given you on the right side my own uh, titles and somehow, you know, I, I keep on criticizing myself. So some of the titles are not very indicative of my main aim of research, like photo editing in orthodontics, how much is too much, although the article is written fine and you can get a lot of information from the article, but the title doesn't tell you much. So it's not a good article, but it was a previous article of 2015. Now, if you see in 2022 and 2023, all the titles now are completely different and they all are in the PICO format, which tells you a lot of how the research will progress. There are three main types of titles. One can be a nominal, where only the main theme is presented, compound, where you have a subtitle, like I said, a randomized clinical trial or a hospital-based studies, you know, so things like that. Or a full sentence title, which are longer and which also tell you more about the research. But that can only be done after the whole study is complete because you don't know the results prior to it. So as I said, if you talk about the PICO format in my in this particular example, which I'm discussing, what are the specific population or the participant uh, that you're talking about, which is the orthodontic patients who have been given retainers? What intervention? You're talking about fixed lingual retainers. What is the comparator? You're talking about the removable lingual uh, removable retainers. And what do you intend to uh, accomplish? Well, the outcome, you're talking about patient tolerance, you're talking about periodontium. And if you also want to add the time for the follow-up, if it's a long duration, you can also talk, talk about the time. So how can the PG guides help in this particular uh, specific uh, time of research? Well, you can, if you talk about topics, you can promote the interdisciplinary research. You can ascertain the acumen of the postgraduates in the first few weeks of their joining. Whether they are good in computers, you can give them a topic related to, you know, softwares or computers. Or if they are very good in uh, basic or the genetic research, you can give them an interesting topic on that. Or if they have shown some keenness on the clinical topics, well, you can give them those clinical topics. Also, if some previous PGs are doing some kind of a research, you can just do a continuing, you can give them topics continuing to their, their research. Or if two or three different department PGs are joining at the same time, you can also give them a similar topic. Like in this particular topic, even a perio PG can work and an ortho PG can work. And their primary research question can become different, but they can help each other. Also, they, if two PGs of the same department are joining, even they can be given a uh, topic which is common to both of them. Like one can be doing a clinical research and one can be taking biological samples on the same patients and can also finish their own thesis. Then train them to read the article. This is very, very important. As I said, 
they may not know right now how to look for the research gaps. So we have to tell them how to look for the research gaps, how to look at the methodology, how to make it more exacting, how to make it more simple, how to make it more reproducible. So they have to be in the habit of reading the articles and what to read first, what to read last. That's also important. Then after they have completed their, uh, you know, the gaps and they have presented to you and you have decided a topic, now they have to perform the review of literature. So how do they uh, present the review of literature? Well, I would suggest to all the PGs that this is one area which can be very easy publication for you. So please, please, uh, you know, get yourself trained in search strategies, in formulating search strategies, so that at this particular time only, now that you've decided your research topic, you have decided your research question, now you just take the keywords, formulate a search strategy and then apply it on three databases and do an evidence-based research just in your review of literature. That is very, very important. You can get an easy publication even before you finish your PGs. And uh, I'm very happy to share that many of the uh, postgraduate institutes have started doing it. They have started, you know, uh, guiding their postgraduates and even taking the external help from external faculty also who are adept at systematic reviews and scoping reviews so that their PGs finish their review of literature in the form of evidence-based research. So you can look for PubMed, Google Scholar, MBA, Scopus, any kind of three major databases and then additionally gray literature can also be searched or you can do reference tra uh, tracking or hand search and Develop the search strategy based on your clinical question. So as I said, you have to be trained to formulate a search strategy. It's very, very interesting. So let me tell you, if you just have even half an hour or 40 minutes of training, at least you will be able to formulate an initial search strategy, which is very, very useful for you based on Boolean terminologies of and, or, and not. So as I said, effect of retainers on periodontal health in orthodontic patients. So you can mix and match these keywords and you can put it on three databases and look for the results. How to read an article, also I said, it's very, very important. So first you look for the title, whether it's important for you, whether it's related to your research question, then read the abstract and in the abstract, look for the summary and the conclusion. As I said, look for the research gaps or then the clear cut aims, objectives because of the research gap, the aims and objectives are formulated then the hypothesis, the conclusions, and later on, the entire article has to be read. If everything fits your criteria, then you go for the whole article. So that's how you read the article. You can also go to this art of reading an article in the journal, very beautiful article. So go through it. Points to consider, you have to prepare your review of literature in an evidence-based format, as I said, based on a pre-formed search strategy. Publish it as a scoping review. Read articles in a systematic manner. As I said, just don't go haphazardly, start with the introduction and read the whole articles, all the articles, and then get confused. Don't do that. And equip yourself. Be very well-versed with how to formulate search strategies, how to go to uh, PubMed databases, what is mesh terminology, how do you formulate the um, and or Boolean terminologies and learn reference management, Zotero, Mendeley, very, very essential for each one of you. There is no shortcut in this. Then understanding the types of research, how kind of, what kind of research are you going to do, whether it is a quantitative research or a qualitative research or a mixed method research. Well, let me tell you, majority of our research are quantitative, which is like you can measure them, like how many millimeter of movement is there and, you know, how much of expansion is there or whatever topics that we usually choose in the clinics. They are based on some kind of numbers or some kind of statistical analysis that way we can compare in numbers and graphs. So that is quantitative research. Qualitative can be expressed in words, which is not usually an area of interest, but yes, some topics can be related to it, like how the patients are, uh, you know, accepting the teleorthodontics or, you know, that kind of a thing, which is not primarily a number-based game. So that can be qualitative research or it can be a mixed method research. But you have to understand that there are two main kinds of study designs that we formulate which is an experimental or an observational study design. Experimental is anything that you do in the clinics that is uh, experimental. And if you randomly allocate the patients like in a fixed retainer or a removable retainer, then that's a randomized control trial. But if you non-randomly 
or you decide beforehand, okay, this patient will have fixed lingual retention and this will have a uh, removal lingual uh, removal retention, then that is a non-randomized trial. And on the other hand, if you want to study the other parameters and if you just want to see this patient has been given uh, lingual retention, now I want to see what is the periodontal health, then it can be an analytical study or a descriptive study. But it is an observational study. You are not giving retainers, but you are just studying the effects of those retainers either on the patient tolerance or on the gingival retention, um, on the gingival health. So that is analytical study. If you are comparing in one direction, it's an analytical study. If you're studying all the parameters related to it, it is a descriptive study. Very, very interesting. But we have to be very clear about the study designs prior to formulating your research hypothesis. So if you don't need to, uh, don't intend to treat, but you just need to observe, then it's an observational study design. If they have already been given fixed lingual retention, as I said, then either it can be analytical or it can be descriptive. And in the analytical also, you can be have cohort or case control or cross-sectional. It's actually, uh, it will take a, a lot of time, but primarily two things you have to be clear. What kind of methods you're going to use, qualitative or quantitative or mixed methods? And what is the study design that you're referring to? Either it is experimental or it is observational. Simple. So at least these two things we have to be very clear about. Then if it is a randomized clinical trial, please be very sure that even before you start your thesis or you start even enrolling one patient, please register in either CTRI, which is Control Trial Registry of India, or clinicaltrial.goe, which is a US-based site. So pre-register it so that your study has value once it gets finished and it will be published very easily. Publication bias, well, you have to read all the articles. When you talk about the review of literature, please look for all the articles, even if they are giving you a negative result. That's also equally, equally important. Even when you are performing your study and you're not getting some positive results, please don't be disheartened. Your study is equally important than the studies which are showing positive results. So there should be no publication bias. So I'm giving the reference at the end of each of the slide. So if you really want to go through it, please go through these articles. Methodology has to be completely reproducible, clear, simple, because if I look at your methodology and I kind of try to do it myself, I should be obtaining the same results. That is the whole idea of writing a methodology. It has to be completely, completely systematic and very, very clear. And yes, sample size calculation is very important because generalizability of your findings is very important. So, Prior to starting your research or in the protocol stage only, please go to the statistician and get your sample size calculated. Inclusion exclusion criteria also have to be formulated prior only. Sample size is definitely a big question. Well, I've again given um, reference below because we cannot discuss the sample size in detail now. You have to have acceptable level of significance, power, expected effect size, underlying event rate and standard deviation in a population. Ethical guidelines, as I said, every institute has its own ethical committee and you have to go through that. And all these guidelines you have to read beforehand, the conflict of interest, the consent of publication. So everything has to be, you know, uh, read for before you apply for the ethical clearance. The authorship criteria, definitely your guides and all the people who are helping you. And even if it's an inter interdisciplinary research, then your co-guide has to be from some other uh, department. So everything has to be drafted in the same way. Please don't go for guest authorship, honorary gift authorship, ghost authorship, or anonymous. So these kind of factors have to be avoided. This is a very interesting quote, actually. But I explained to Mr. Calabresi, I cannot possibly put the names of all of his family members on my paper. So yes, you know, you see, He's kind of held by two men and he's being told to put their names. Well, this is just a joke, but please don't go for these ghost or the guest authorships. Well, I'm very, very interested when we talk about research, at least for orthodontic community, I request to our president, Dr. Puneet Batra now and to the whole IUS team that if we can have a central repository, and I think they've started working upon it because they have started uh, collecting all the titles of all the theses which are being uh, conducted all across the country. So if we can have a central repository, well, that is that will be very, very beneficial for all of you because you can take a help 
if some other PGs of some other institute are doing in the same domain, at least you can take help regarding methodology. Or maybe you would not replicate the same thing that is being done in any other place. So yes, that is also very, very important. Then you can also formulate your data extraction tables because now you know that this is your research question and you have formulated all your uh, strategies prior and you have looked for the methodology also. But now the data that has to be collected in that research, you have to formulate those tables prior only before you start even doing one patient because those have to be standardized and all the data has to be, maybe it is a study characteristics or the result or the statistics or the participant characteristics. Any kind of table, you have to maintain an Excel sheet and you have to start entering there. Photographic specification also very, very important, important consideration because even in your uh, thesis stage, whenever you look for photographs, you have to have some guidelines. There are DW Chrome guidelines for all the uh, photographs that are mentioned in good publications. So if you are taking those photographs, please follow those guidelines. And these are a few of the articles that you can refer to. And this is again, my own article, Photo Editing in Orthodontics. So you can look for those DW Chrome guidelines that we have applied on orthodontics. So yes, when you start uh, looking for pictures or you start taking pictures for your thesis, please be very clear about that. Attach metadata, maintain raw files so that it can be presented when, whenever it's asked for. Thesis writing is again, you know, once that you've collected all the data, now the thesis writing is for introduction, aims, objectives, review literature, material methods, results, discussion. Uh, you know, this is not the time to discuss the publishing part in much detail because all the IMRAD format, if you talk about, which is introduction, material methods, results, discussion, and conclusion, that separately itself is a very big topic. And before you start writing that, you can look for tutorials or you can have some, uh, you can request your guides to have some classes related to it because it is very, very important that you understand how to go through the flow, you know. So in the flow, the introduction, as you see, is an inverted funnel. So it's a broad, it uh, refers to a broad area when you're introducing the topic. And then you again, you are narrowing down to the research gap. And then again, you are saying, okay, because this is the research gap, now my main aim is this. And this is the objectives that we have formulated. And based on the research objectives, now this is the methodology that we have taken and the whole methodology in detail. And these are the results that we have got. Every result is discussed in detail with the previous literature, which is present. And it is discussed for and against. And then the conclusions are presented. Well, my take here is that first, first and foremost, when you are presenting the review of literature, you should not be just cut pasting the abstract of all the articles and presenting is there. I have very clearly told you that please present it in the form of a scoping review. So that thing is taken care of. But for each article that you have taken in the scoping review, you should have one line at least how it relates to your thesis. So you can either say this refutes it or you can say, okay, this was the one which was not discussed in this article. So I, we are considering this, any kind of thing. But in the review of literature, it should be your own. It should not be just a cut paste thing. And when you talk about the conclusions or the major findings, please, I recommend to all the postgraduate guides also that we should have one paragraph of clinical implications of how it is directly going to benefit our clinics or our healthcare practices or any kind of intervention that we are planning in relation to it. So they should have some clinical implications when we are doing a three-year uh, research. So it's a very big primary um, research that we are producing in the form of a thesis. So it should have good clinical implications. So introduction, as I said, so you can, uh, it introduces the research, presents the problem and tells how and why this is. So beginning, middle and end. Well, um, in the introduction also, when you log, when you talk about your thesis introduction, please try to make some flowchart so that, that, that you understand the whole topics. Like this is my own uh, flowchart that I had presented in my introduction because I was understanding the interleukin 1 beta. So as I said, I always kind of prepare mind maps and a flowchart is also kind of mind map. So the examiner would immediately know that, okay, you understand the concept in a very good way. So it's just kind of a help for you. 
where to search we've already discussed the journal articles books conference proceedings well the difference between a manuscript and a thesis here is that at the end of a thesis you present a bibliography because as i said when i was looking for interleukin 1 beta i tried to read the biochemistry chem books and i i tried to read everything possible on this world to understand interleukin 1 beta functioning so it was not only the journal articles that i was referring to mostly in the um, manuscripts that we publish we go by references which pertains to books or reference articles but when we talk about bibliography it includes everything that we have studied for when we talk about thesis so bibliography and references is different so bibliography is the one which is presented in thesis and there we include the conference reports we include the thesis dissertations the electronic journal cd roms newspapers everything that we have referred to referencing as i said in text referencing or the back referencing so reference management software no shortcuts you have to learn so all kind of reference styles are there and quoting referencing everything has to be known paraphrasing is just putting it in your own words and then presenting because if you kind of present the exact lines that are present in some other article it will come under plagiarism and that you cannot afford material methods how was the data collected so details of materials that were used so some do's and don'ts keep a record of all the things select the notes for the final write up present tense uh, has to be used for the um, equipments that we used and the passive voice was what you did so this kind of small nuances have to be there when you talk about material methods results and discussions can be analytical or argumentative mostly because we are talking about thesis it has to be argumentative because you have to take a stand for the results that you've got and it has to be in reference to the previous literature summary and conclusion that have to be very direct and it has to be in the statistical terms if you are doing a quantitative research it has to be in form of statistical terms and a very interesting quote as i said plagiarism your work is good and original but unfortunately the parts that are good are not original and the parts that are original are not good so you cannot afford that so any kind of plagiar plagiarism whether it is indirect mosaic self plagiarism anything that is not allowed so this is the final form of thesis now that we have talked about the whole concept of going from a research area to a research topic to a research question to our aims and objectives to our material methodology to writing the uh, uh, thesis based on introduction material methods results discussion conclusion and now the publishing well this is the final format that you will have when you and you'll be very happy holding this final format in your uh, hand and uh, obviously you are going to go with the guidelines that are provided by your institute to publish this thesis but one mistake that i have done in my thesis which will be there in aims lifelong which is in this panel i forgot to get my title published and if you look at the uh, library in my uh, in the aims department all the thesis will have the uh, title published here but i forgot to do it so don't do these kind of mistakes be very very diligent when you go for the final printing and it will be a very very big satisfaction factor for you so take home is this is the last slide so i'm sticking to my time actually so i did not discuss many things in detail but the take home is follow all the steps and take no shortcuts understand your topic this is your topic and no one not even i'm sorry to say not even the guide would know so much about the topic as much as you know about it and choose your topic very wisely go by the finer criteria the feasibility the interesting novelty ethical and relevance so go by that make a road map yes timelines are very important although in thesis right now we don't employ a gantt chart gantt chart is a timeline chart but we should apply a timeline chart there because in these 3 years what are the process that are going to complete that you're going to complete in first year second year or third year that you have to be very clear do the search systematically again i'm telling you review of literature can be your direct publication even before you appear for your pg exam so publish it as your scoping review write the introduction because the introduction is not going to change write it in the first year itself so they do not hassled when you come to the third year so you've already you know write the introduction and material methods and keep it separate perform each step ethically diligently and note down all the positive 
and the negative findings. Please don't think that you can put the negative findings under the carpet. Don't do that because your negative findings are equally important as much as the positive findings. Don't plagiarize. Use all kind of anti-plagiarism softwares, even if you don't have access, access to Authenticate or Turnitin, which are paid softwares, you can request or your guide can request to the other uh, institutes who have the access because they are the best uh, anti-plagiarism softwares. Or at least do the minimal anti-plagiarism check yourself by the free softwares that are available. Use reference management software, Zotero or Mendeley. There is no shortcut. You have to get yourself trained in it even before you start writing your protocol. Other softwares for help can also be used. As I said, if you're using Chat Jeopardy or Jenny, you can use it after some kind of a training, but please don't base yourself on it. Do your homework and then you look for help. Be proficient in search. Be very, very proficient. Take training in formulating search strategies and doing the proper kind of research. Please own your thesis. It's your own thing. It's your private, personal primary research that you are going to publish in three years and there are no shortcuts and convert it into a worthy manuscript please don't leave it as such so that is my take home today and i'm very thankful once again to ios for giving me this opportunity i hope i was able to at least initiate a few thoughts in the postgraduates present in the audience today and i'll be very happy to help this is my uh, mail id so thank you so much once again